Um, I would like I would like to welcome everybody on behalf of the Foundation Democracy and Media, Democracy and Media. I would like to welcome you all, the audience, and especially our foreign guests, the activists, the scholars, the journalists, the filmmakers, many of whom will be speakers in the coming days in the workshops and in the panels. My name is Marianne Sachs. I am one of the board members of the Foundation Democracy and Media. And I would like to tell you, very short, what our foundation is about and why and how we organize this conference. First of all, about the, our foundation. I need to go back in history. The beginning of our foundation goes back to World War II in which in 1941, the first printed illegal newspaper appeared, Het Parol, the watchword, Het Parol, free and fearless. In the following years, this illegal newspaper reached editions of 100,000 copies. And this was not an easy thing to do because journalists, printers, and the people who did the illegal deliveries lived under a constant threat of arrest by the Germans. Many people who worked for Het Parol during the war have been incarcerated and many paid with their lives for the resistance work that they did. After the liberation in 1945, Het Parol continued as a legal newspaper and the ownership was placed in a non-profit foundation to prevent commercial interest to influence the content of the newspaper. And it is this foundation that, after some changes in the course of the years, which is now the Foundation Democracy and Media. I'm telling you this old history to emphasize that the Foundation Democracy and Media has its roots in the resistance and in the struggle for freedom and independence which are values which we also stimulate and stand for in the present. I'm very proud to welcome Wim van Noorden and his wife, who is sitting here in front, lonely because all the other places are still empty, and who is one of the founders of the Parole, and who was also his director in the 60s, and he, who is now the honorary chair of our foundation. Very welcome, Wim. So what does the foundation do? We support and we invest and we develop, as is in our name, activities about media and democracy. We stimulate quality media, old and new, and quality journalism. And on the democracy side, we support, other paper, we support initiatives for an innovative and vibrant democracy. We do that with grants, with investments, and our own activities like this conference. Now, why did we organize this conference? Also in the Netherlands, as in other countries in Europe, we are confronted with a conservative backlash with nationalist and fundamentalist elements. And also in the Netherlands, the alienation and mistrust of people is felt with the established democratic institutions because people don't feel represented by the existing political structures. But unlike in other countries, little public debate or public revolt has been happening here. The Occupy movement had only, and other recent uprisings have only had a very weak echo in this country. The protest movements and revolutions of young people the millennium generation, that's you, a, a new generation of activists who think global, who develop collective leadership, who use the new media, who make concrete demands and who have no trust in the existing, pol existing political structures, that has not really taken off here in the Netherlands. And in the Dutch media, there is very little attention for what is happening in this respect in the rest of the world the reactions to the global economic crisis actually are only 
reported on when there is a violent outburst or when there are 10,000 people somewhere gathered in, on a square. And what's happening in neighborhoods, what's happening in the movement, what's happening in factories gets very little attention. That is why we from Democracy and Media thought we wanted to do something to stimulate, also in the Netherlands, the public debate and learn about what is happening in other parts of the world. So I contacted Marianne Mecklenberg, who you will see in a little while and who many of you have been emailing with, who is an expert at the University of Leiden in globalization and social movements. And I asked her, what can we as a foundation do? And after some months, she came back with the idea of this conference to enable activists and scholars and journalists to meet and to exchange idea and to use some time together to really stimulate each other's ideas and thoughts. Mariana, together with Brandon Jordan, the filmmaker, have worked tireless to contact the people they know, to ask their ideas, and to make a program for this conference. And the Bali has done a lot of the logistics and very flexible and very at the last moment, so we're very grateful for that. And now, it is up to you, my friends, to make it happen. I wish us all an inspiring, interesting, and also fun event. Thank you. Now, you can keep going. I mean, uh, no, uh, that was a very nice and warm welcome, and uh, we definitely grateful for all the help that we've gotten on this and we're really happy that everybody came and there was another component of organizing this event that uh, we I'd like to talk about really briefly and that's the fact that a lot of people uh, sort of did a lot of self-organization and in, in inviting uh, a lot of other people and we just looked to our friends and our contacts in different places and they invited other friends and other contacts I'm not actually going to talk a whole bunch tonight um, I just want to talk a little bit about our project, um, which is the, some of you may be familiar with, We Make Films. And we've done about 20 films on the kind of uprisings that have happened over the last two or three years, um, which is all online at globaluprisings.org. Uh, when a Democracy and Media contacted us and had us organize this, they asked us to put together a 20 or 30 minute, basically reel of uh, the things that we've covered the last few years. Um, so instead of doing some elaborate speech, which I'm not feeling like is necessary at all, um, we'd like to show this, um, and then we're going to bring up Paul Mason. Uh, but just want to thank everybody for coming, and uh, man, do you have anything you want to say? Just thank you really to everyone who came and who helped organize the program. Uh, Marianne gave us the credit for that, but we also really uh, drew from a lot of the ideas of the people who are here today to give shape to that and to the ideas and inspiration that we've had over the past three years of going around the world or going to at least a few of the countries where the uprisings have been and really seeing what motivates people, inspires people. And uh, so thank you to all of you for that. And, and just one other thing, this, this space right here is only one part of uh, this event. Uh, we also tried to contact other people who are in social centers and squats here because we also want to bring uh, some attention to issues going on in the Netherlands. Uh, a lot of times people look abroad and they think about problems abroad and they think about movements abroad, but they don't. It's easier to do that than actually do stuff around uh, your own city. Um, so, of course, uh, there's going to be parties at the Frank Reich. There's going to be uh, other events and other spaces, D4 and everything. There's an extended program that you'll find in the foyer. Uh, so be sure to check that out and, and realize there's a lot of stuff going on and we're going to try to have a good time um, and also a productive time. So thanks. Is it working? Yes, it is. Okay. Um, so now we have the pleasure to uh, invite and welcome. Uh, we have the pleasure to welcome Paul Mason. I'm sorry. I don't... Oh, the movie. Oh my God. I'm so sorry. <laughs>
Today's political climate is characterized by widespread political upheaval. Streets and squares across the world have become the site of massive demonstrations, strikes, occupations, riots, rebellions, and revolutions. It's not just happening in Spain, it's not just happening in London, it's not just happening in France or the United States or Latin America, but it's happening everywhere. From the Arab Spring to the movement of the squares in Southern Europe, and from there to the global Occupy movement and the uprisings in Turkey and Brazil, people everywhere have been challenging the power of governments and economic elites. We have a political system that doesn't really give many viable, realistic, effective options for people to take real change into their lives. In the aftermath of the financial crisis that swept across the world in 2008, the social and political consequences of economic structures have become severely visible. You're dealing with what people have been very right to describe as a financial nuclear bomb. The economic crisis exposed to millions of people worldwide the priorities of most politicians. From the point of view of economics, an economy is a mechanism for allocating resources to produce goods to meet consumption needs. Capitalism is not actually a mechanism for allocating resources to produce goods to meet consumption needs. Capitalism is a system for producing profits for the owners of capital. And uh, money will be invested in production if and only if it is sufficiently profitable. A policy of deregulation of financial systems allowed financial markets to become increasingly important to national and global economic output. New forms of mortgages were created so that they could be packaged and sold as financial instruments. There was an enormous amount of speculation in uh, housing that mortgages were sold to people who were clearly not going to be able to pay for them, that these mortgages were then packaged and represented in various ways and sold to various other people and resold and became very imbrigated in the global financial system. And as soon as a sufficiently large number of people began to be unable to pay their mortgages, that financial house of cards began to fall apart and that produced a financial crisis which then led to uh, a general economic downturn. So that's more or less the official story. So this official story is clearly inadequate. This is really an episode in a very old story. Capitalism experienced its first major, you could even say first global economic crisis in the 1820s. This has been a regular occurrence since that period. So for 150 years, we have had an alternation of periods of prosperity and periods of depression. What is unusual is that there hasn't been a serious crisis of this depth since the 1930s, although it seemed as though there was going to be one in the mid-1970s. So people, you could say, have forgotten that capitalism once was characterized by a regular recurrence of depressions. And for that reason, people seem to be very surprised. And just as they did in the early 19th century, people try to explain this particular event in terms of immediate occurrences of the present rather than in terms of this long-term pattern. But in a funny way, what we're experiencing now is the deep depression, which might have come in the 1970s, but which was averted and kept at bay by the constant expansion of debt, government, private, corporate. And this process of debt creation reached a point beyond which it's seemingly it was impossible to keep it going, which explains why all over the world now, in the face of continuing depression conditions, governments are trying to cut back on their spending, to cut back on their borrowing, that the new mantra of every government is to reduce deficits, to pay off their loans and so forth, which I think, in fact, they will not be able to do. But the limit of debt expansion has been reached, and so we have once again a return to the sort of depression conditions which actually have been a common recurrent feature of the whole history of capitalism. En, el, en la sociedad capitalista se vive en continua crisis, y si no en continua crisis, en una situación de totalmente eh, impredecible. Es un sistema basado, articulado, en poner toda la riqueza común y toda la riqueza pública en beneficio privado. In order to keep national budget deficits down, many governments chose to cut spending on social services, pensions and education and to raise the retirement age. Y cuando hablamos de eh, los recortes, lo que significa eh, los recortes en la sanidad, los recortes en la salud, eh, el aumento de la jubilación, de la edad de jubilación a los 67 años, son todo medidas sociales extremadamente violentas contra la mayor parte de la población que rara vez se le aplican a aquellos que están tomando esas decisiones. Están recortando de todo, no hay derecho, de colegios, de becas, todo lo que es educación lo están recortando. 
As people watched their governments align themselves with financial interests, a broader crisis of legitimacy that had been building for a long time took hold, and the outrage many felt erupted onto the streets. We've been here saying that the markets will decide for Greece, for Spain, for Italy. Who the fuck is the markets? All the politicians agree that we owe billions of pounds to the bankers and therefore we've got to pay to losing our pensions and jobs. We owe the bankers nothing. We don't owe them one penny. People are so fed up. Our economics is not working, our politics is not working, our unions are not working, as our legal system is not working. There's nothing for, for the state to promise now. What? Better, better education, better wages, uh, better life? Nothing. They cannot promise anything. In the immediate aftermath of the economic crisis, protests proliferated around the world. In the US, people organized to rescue families facing eviction from their homes. Workers occupied Republic Windows and Doors factory in Chicago, and students occupied their universities. In Europe, angry protests and riots swept across the continent. In Greece, Riots engulfed the streets for three consecutive weeks in the aftermath of the police shooting of Alexandros Grigoropoulos. In Iceland, the protests led to the ousting of the Conservative government. In 2010, general strikes took place across Europe, with major strikes in Greece, France, Spain, and the first general strike in over 22 years in Portugal. In the UK, spectacular student protests took headlines across the world when students stormed the Conservative Party's headquarters in London. None of the eruptions in Europe or the US, however, would compare to the explosion of popular revolt in North Africa and the Middle East. The uprisings that began in Tunisia in December 2010, when Mohamed Bouazizi set himself on fire, quickly grew as public outrage over the incident spread. The protest eventually led to the fall of the Ben Ali regime that had ruled Tunisia since 1987. On January 25, 2011, the anger spread to Egypt, where diverse movements of demonstrations, marches, occupations, riots, civil resistance, and labor strikes took down the dictator Hosni Mubarak in just 18 days. In Tunisia and Egypt, the ruling governments embarked on decades of economic liberalization from the 1970s onwards. We cannot understand Mubarak's dictatorship and the kind of repression we lived under in Egypt without realizing this is part of economic system. I think the economic factors were incredibly important in, in getting people to the point where they really risked everything and went to the streets. Following what's happening in Egypt in the last 30 years, but especially the last 15 years, that was a very aggressive movement towards what we call economic reform, which is basically more privatization, uh, less workers' rights, less workplace rights, and opening up the market more and more. The policy of the Egyptian government was to attract as much business as possible. It didn't matter to them how labor was treated. It didn't matter to them what kind of uh, environmental effects these kind of uh, projects were having. Although the policies of the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund often went uncriticized, the structural adjustment programs that these institutions forced onto Tunisia and Egypt were contributing factors in the economic and social crises that culminated in the Arab Spring. The Arab Spring continued to spread to Libya, Syria, Bahrain, Yemen, and even further. The emancipatory message of the Arab Spring quickly spread and became a source of inspiration for protesters around the world. What few commentators predicted was that the anti-authoritarianism embodied in the Arab Spring would resonate in Europe and the US, where despite the official presence of democracy, people felt disenfranchised and powerless to determine even the most basic aspects of their lives. In mid-February 2011, workers, students and teachers occupied the Capitol building in Madison, Wisconsin to protest the introduction of budget cuts and the erosion of collective bargaining rights. On February 23, 2011, following a massive general strike, people in Greece attempted to occupy Syntagma Square in front of Parliament. So after uh, the, the strike itself, there was a call by some people, and some people even spontaneously decided to stay at the main square, which is just outside Parliament, inspired by the revolts in, in Egypt and in uh, the rest of the North African countries and to hold the square for as much as we could. We had the slogan that we will go to the Constitution Square and we will remain in the Constitution Square. On March 26, 2011, hundreds of thousands of people in the UK took to the streets in the second largest demonstration in London's history. At the end of the march, the protesters attempted to occupy and hold Trafalica Square. I think often there's sort of the perception that we are uh, supposed to teach people something in the Middle East, but I think we've really been learning that um, you know, standing up 
to politicians, to governments, and going out on the streets can make a difference. But it wasn't until May 15, 2011, that the tactic of occupying a public square and holding it was successful on a large scale in Europe. Thousands of people across Spain occupied their public squares, held massive general assemblies, and voiced their growing anger against the government. The movement of the squares quickly spread across Europe. On May 25th, people in Greece were finally able to take and hold Syntagma Square. They set up camp and refused to move. The occupation of public squares rose again on September 17, 2011, this time in the United States, when people in New York City organized a mass mobilization to occupy Wall Street. They moved to nearby Zuccotti Park, set up tents, and renamed the park Liberty Square. The protesters' anger at the financial system and the politicians who were responsible for the crisis resonated with people across the U.S. and the occupation spread quickly. On October 15, 2011, as part of an international day of action, people all over the world took to the streets with nearly 1,000 different actions in over 82 different countries. The day of action was called the Day of Rage, in homage to the Egyptian Revolution. Well, I mean, what's really exciting is, you know, usually when you have these world revolutionary moments, whether it's 1789, whether it's 1848, 1917, either it happens everywhere, or it happens in a country a little bit peripheral to the capitalist center. But now it's actually hitting the center. And this is very exciting. Ordinarily, this doesn't happen. Each occupation was shaped by its own specific history. In Oakland, where there was a long history of police repression and radical struggle, the protests were characterized by a more militant tone, fueled by the recent Oscar Grant riots in 2009 and the university occupations throughout 2009 and 2010. The New Year's Eve killing in 2009 of um, Oscar Grant by white police officers in front of tons of cell phone cameras sparked off um, some of the biggest rioting that California has seen since the Rodney King riots. What it did is that it brought to the light the in actual injustice by the law enforcement agencies. When the police first raided the Oakland Commune, the attacks resulted in Iraq War veteran Scott Olson being hospitalized with a severe head injury after being shot in the head with a tear gas canister. Occupy Oakland responded by calling for a general strike which culminated in the shutting down of the fifth largest port in the United States. As part of the Oakland general strike, we will march on the port of Oakland and shut it down. We are doing this in order to blockade the flow of capital on the day of the general strike, as well as to show our commitment to solidarity with the longshore workers in their struggle against EGT. In March 2012, rebellion also took hold in Canada, when students in Montreal launched a student strike that quickly transformed into a popular movement with hundreds of thousands of people in the street. Meanwhile in Europe, on March 29, 2012, independent Basque unions in Spain called for a general strike. The independent unions and the network of neighborhood assemblies that grew out of the 15 May movement joined the call. Feeling the pressure from below, several major unions endorsed the strike. The strike brought major cities across Spain to a standstill, with an estimated 77% work stoppage. Due to the involvement of neighborhood assemblies and a large unemployed population, there was also a call for a widespread consumption strike. Stores that attempted to open for business were met with crowds of protesters organizing pickets or blockades. So on the 29th of March, in addition to the labor union strikes, pickets in different workplaces and all of this, and in different neighborhoods, you started to see, well, neighborhood assemblies of different types of non-union workers contributing and doing sort of informative pickets where they inform folks of why they shouldn't go to work that day or why they shouldn't open those stores that day. We could easily reach consumers and individuals that are not organized or they don't feel uh, represented by unions and asking them and explain them that not only to stop working this day, it's much more if you don't have to mm, spend any money on this 29th of uh, March. On November 14, 2012, the CGTP trade union in Portugal called for the first European-wide general strike. In Lisbon, the strike became one of the largest and most militant general strikes since the fall of the dictatorship. The main thing about the latest demonstrations probably is that they were slightly bigger than, do, than we were used to, which means that people are waking up finally and realizing that if they don't do anything, things will just get worse every time. There were also major strikes and protests in Spain, Greece, Italy, Belgium and Germany. Well, the fact that the general strike was called first in Portugal on the 14th of November by the trade unions and then other trade unions joined was important in, in European level. If we can go more and more towards this kind of international mobilization and dimension maybe the, the soft nationalism that kind of comes up in most of the demonstrations against austerity will lose some of its ground and 
we'll be able to create this strong idea that we're in this international situation, international problems, and that we need to organize our struggles in an international way. Despite widespread protests by populations worldwide, the gap between government policy and people's needs continues to grow. There's a real um, crisis of governance, and I don't think it's just limited to Egypt. It's, it's quite a, a global crisis, and that's what I think connects what's happening in Egypt to places like Greece, to places like Portugal, places like Ireland, even to the Occupy movement in the US. In many places, leaders have been overthrown or voted out of office, but the political and economic system has remained unchanged. Elections almost have this magical sense to them, but when it comes down to it, there's actually very little value in that process, because it's not allowing for change. It's not actually at all empowering the people to have their voice heard. We see people in Europe, in Western Europe and in the US taking the streets and living in the streets actually, occupying spaces because apparently democratic process didn't bring much to them. The only way people will make their voice heard is by going to the streets. In the summer of 2013, protests once again erupted around the world. This time the uprisings were not taking place in a context of economic crisis, but in countries such as Turkey and Brazil that were still experiencing economic growth. Despite this economic growth, inequality and alienation were on the rise. All the Turkish economy at the moment is based on uh, infrastructure, construction, and that means work for the people, but that's totally precarious work. And there's this great inequality as well. Nobody would be okay to live in such a system. So what we see here is also uh, an uprising against this economical violence that the people are facing. In late May 2013, protesters attempted to stop the development of Istanbul's Gezi Park and Taksim Square. The response of the police was to heavily attack the protesters. As the images of police violence spread across Turkey and the world, people came out en masse into the streets, and the uprising spread to over 72 cities in Turkey. And this was a protest against the uh, demolishing of the park, but it suddenly, immediately uh, changed its face, and it became a protest against uh, the state terrorism and police brutality. The, the protest didn't become only something bigger, but it became uh, uh, something different. It has become a medium of the, uh, of the expression of the accumulated anger over years. Uh, people feel it. Feel, they, they, they feel the, this you know, overall regression in the, uh, in the democratic rights and freedoms. If we don't stand our ground now, we lose all our uh, freedoms, all our rights, and um, you see there is a point, there is no turning back. You can only go forward. It was one of those points. In June 2013, as the streets of Turkey were still awash in tear gas, a large-scale protest movement emerged in Brazil. The protests were initially against an increase in public transport costs, but quickly transformed into a movement against persistent economic inequality and political exclusion. At the same time, protests erupted in other places around the world, including Bulgaria, Bosnia and Indonesia. On June 30th, 2013, once again millions of people flooded the streets of Egypt to demand the resignation of democratically elected President Mohamed Morsi. The military hijacked the popular uprising and pushed Morsi out of power. The violence that ensued has cloaked Egypt's future and the potential for revolutionary change in a blanket of uncertainty. While upheavals and uprisings are now a daily reality internationally, neither the state nor capital have diminished in strength. As movements continue to emerge and are growing increasingly networked across national borders, many people say that the way forward is not to make demands of leaders, but to build solutions from the bottom up in our everyday lives so that we can meet our own needs and the needs of others. What we're discovering together is new ways of organizing that are horizontal, that are empowering to communities, that actually people take their lives into their own hands. We're not making demands of power. We're not asking for change. We're making the change ourselves. We're building resilient communities that can take care of ourselves, that can feed ourselves, that can house ourselves, and that can resist capitalism and the failures of representative democracy. There's no matter how much we struggle here, and no matter how much we manage to win, if we are winning, 
we would never be able to do it on our own. This is an international movement, it's an international struggle, and we need to have victories and we need to have struggle everywhere if we're going to have any chance of succeeding. Aparentemente, ahora mismo estamos poco coordinados, pero pienso y estimo que llegará un momento en que todos nos demos cuenta que la, nos demos cuenta que la lucha es la misma. No es una cuestión laboral, no es una cuestión social, no es una cuestión económica. Es la supervivencia del planeta y del ser humano lo que está en juego. Nos daremos cuenta y lo que necesitamos es un día y una hora que todo el planeta nos pongamos en pie.